Um, I mean, I see it popping up on the U tabs. And mine is just as a video subscriber. 13 waiting, scheduled, 850. I mean, I'm probably logged into your account, so. Let's see here. Skip ad. Um, I see me. Uh, somebody is saying hi. Hey, everyone out there. Uh, let us know if you can see us. Um, it's saying that the video is private for some reason. Um, so I'm wondering if I'm the only one that's able to see myself right now. But Jason Saul says he can see us, so. Sounds good. And people are tuning in. Yes. All right. People say that they see us. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, computer said that uh, our video is private, so we're like, what's going on there? Uh, audio is sounding grispy, too. That is always a beautiful thing. Peter's got our outlines bringing over. And <laughs> my eyes are telling my brain that you are there. Yes. Comment of the day. Uh Beer kudo points to uh, to you, whoever that was, Eric. <laughs> what everybody wants in life, beer kudos. Uh, well, welcome to our live stream. We do this every single Sunday at 845. If you have beer interestness in life and want to hang out with us while we talk about beer, you should uh, tune in every Sunday at 845. So grab your morning beer, chug it, and then grab a second one so that you can get through this uh, live stream with us. Today's live stream is going to be really fun. We're talking about wild style fermentations, going into some Britannomyces a little bit, going into some, uh, you know, what happens when you age things for a long time in the wild beer world. And uh, so if you're, yeah, if you're interested in that, then you'll have some, uh, some fun skedans. Going to dive down that wormhole uh, that is Britannomyces. And uh, I, know, I know Peter and I discussed a little bit about going into the wood, but we're probably just going to touch on that. Yeah. Um, or the wood going into your beer. Every time, every time. Well, that's that's the thing. That's <laughs> how you get saying, new people tuning in from Croatia. Croatia. Wow, Croatia. Croatia. Uh, you probably pronounce it wrong anyway. Words are <laughs> hard. Um, and uh, yeah, for those of you that have not seen our live broadcast yet, how it works is we generally start out with um, some news from Genus, sometimes some news from the beer world in general, um, which we transition into a beer of the week where we do a, a, a breakdown on a random BJCP style. Um, which this week is going to be Brett beer. Um, and then uh, we go into a discussion topic. And after that, we open it up for general questioning. So um, welcome all. All everyone is still tuning in. So, uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and get started with our uh, genus news for the week. First and foremost, our editor slash social media dude slash now able to be bartender turns 21. Yeah, that was weird. I yeah, gave, I gave him beer. He's a real man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ryan is uh, one of our employees here, and he is now of legal drinking age um, for where we live. And, yeah, so that was fun on Friday, too. What a great day for a 21st birthday. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, so. Except for, you know, most bars being halfway shut down. But other uh, than that. I, I mean, there's that, but let's be <laughs> real. We just gave him free beer from us anyway. So, <laughs> Which I'd, I'd call that a win. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, he, he drank good beer, so that's, exactly. that's a start. Uh, uh, other beer news, we got our two-barrel fermenter all set up, and it is currently fermenting beer. You might have seen that if you watched our videos earlier in the week because we posted a video on it. Yeah, and it is holding temp just fine. We have not crashed it yet. That's going to yeah. be the big test on that little tiny glycol chiller. Yeah, see if it's big enough for uh, to, yeah. to do a two-barrel and all the one-barrels. Yeah, the I'm, thinking, I'm thinking the limitations aren't going to be the uh, the glycol chiller itself so much as that little pump that's in there. Yeah. I feel like those those little pumps aren't really designed to move um, as much glycol. So. Yeah, and I'm thinking that that reaction rod that's in that glycol uh, or in the, uh, in the fermenter actually might have a lot of resistance compared to – Yeah, that's exactly, yeah. A so regular you, you got more resistance, you got less surface area. I feel like we might have to like – rig up like a secondary pump just to try to get some more flow out of it it's possible but you know what we're gonna try because that's what we do here we yeah. see stuff and it we'll call uh, it an opportunity and we make it work and it'll be great we'll, we'll probably do some post share it with all you out there um and kind of let let you all know how how far how low it gets down without messing with it so get low I, I feel like we'll get well into the 40s at least yeah hopefully that'll be so. good enough for us um and then finally we uh we made a really big boozy yummy delicious stout uh downtown at uh, the bigger location where we do other 
their beers, and then our glycol chiller went out there. So that uh, ended yeah. up venting at like 80 degrees for a little bit. Yeah, we uh, tried to ruin a beer apparently, so it was a good thing I checked on that and then ended up having to deal with that for pretty much all day yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Besides um, the fact that it uh, might give some off flavors from the warm fermentation, we also lost about... I don't know, 10, 15 gallons of beer. So. Oh, yeah. It was it was a good good half barrel, if not even a little bit more, unfortunately. So, so that happened. That was a bummer, especially yep. since we literally, the last thing we did the night before was, like, turn the temp down to the low end of that yeast spectrum so that it wouldn't blow so off it wouldn't, as much. Yeah, <laughs> we wouldn't end up losing beer. We're happy yeah. one's low in that. Yeah, uh, it came in the next morning, and it's at 80, and we're like, ooh. Dang it. Something's not right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, that's that is, we for that. yeah, that's our beer news. Otherwise, it's fairly uneventful week, I'd say. Uh, yeah. Things are just sort of chugging along here in Spokane. Doing work in the tap room, getting some people in for some beers. Yeah. So, um, yeah, starting to see some regular customers coming back in. So that's always nice. Um, otherwise, yeah, let's go on to our beer of the week. Boop, 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 boop. Beer of the week. Boom, boom. Boom. And that is going to be uh, American Wild Ale. I, like, just kind of scrolled all the way down to the bottom of the BJCP um, <laughs> guidelines when I when I decided to pick this one out. And uh, and we actually, I think we have a beer that we spiked with uh, with some Brettanomyces. Yeah, our super um, delicious Belgian quad. We said, here's a keg. Yeah. This is your keg. Brett, live in here. Yep. So, um, so yeah, American Wild Ale, and then the subcategory of that that we are going to be focusing on for today is going to be um, Brett beer, and that is um, category 28A um, for BJCP. Uh, so, yeah, kind of a fun category. It's a very open category to, uh, to start out with because um, Brett beer can really be any base beer that you're adding Brett to. Um, with that said, um, the it does sort of guideline out um, things that it's going to work a lot better with. Um, generally, they're going to be hop forward beers. Generally, um, the, you're going to have a beer designed around um, the flavor profile of the Brett. It's usually not a good idea just to throw Brett at a random beer and see what happens. I mean, um, sometimes that's a good idea, though. <laughs> if you screw a beer up, throw Brett at it. It might it might save it. Or it we, might yeah, we've definitely had it saved. I mean, there are certain really compounds dead. that Brett can eat that uh, yeah, don't taste yeah, good. Definitely. And then after Brett eats them, they turn into the tasty good compounds. Um, yeah, so, um, but anyway, overall impressions of a Brett beer um, is that um, the beer will typically be um, drier than the base beer. Um, and that just has to do with the tendency of Brett to dry things out. Brett is... Um, I don't know if you would call it a diastatic as variant because it does produce the amylase. It's got so there's two um, different kinds of Brett uh, general categories in this. There's endo and exo um, uh, amylase uh, producing Bretts. So there's Bretts that basically only make enzyme enzymes inside of their cells, and there's Bretts that actually will put enzymes out into the world. The Bretts that put enzymes out into the world, and by the world I mean your beer, those are the ones that will dry things bone dry. Yep. So generally, you're gonna expect um, drier beer from Brett. Um, and uh, so a Brett fermented beer um, can be um, co-fermented um, with Brettanomyces and a Saccharomyces strain, or it can actually be 100% Brett fermented, which we've actually done with a great success in the past. Yeah, we've had a lot of good 100% uh, um, Brett fermented beers. Actually, I was just watching one of our first videos. Uh, I want to say that's like number five that we did out of all this was fermenting a beer with Brett. We yeah, Brett Pale Ale. Yeah, it was Brett it was Pale, and it was tasty. delicious. Yeah. Um, which brings us to um, the fact that if you do use 100% Brett to ferment these beers, um, this style, you're often going to see um, uh, nice fruity notes um, when the beer is young. And uh, one of the things that it says is that as the beer ages, those fruity notes will fade into your more funky notes, especially if you're using um, Brett Bruxellensis strains. Mm -hmm. um, so um, be it the Lambicus or, or the regular Brux, um, those are going to get funkier with age. Um, and uh, one of the things that you have to consider with Brett is how long you're going to age this beer for. Um, the longer you're going to age it, the more it's going to dry out, the more you're going to get those funky notes. However, um, one thing I'm going to just like lay out there right off the top is that you don't actually need to age these beers. Um, you know, you can do a typical two or three week fermentation and be just fine with a beer even fermented 100% with Brett. Um, otherwise, uh, you're generally uh, wanna going to want to choose uh, hop strains that will complement um, the yeast. So you want to complement that fruitiness, complement that funkiness. Um, and then typically um, the, they will be lighter beers, simpler grain bills. Um, however, darker versions can exist. Um, with uh, any sort of bread, 
Uh, we kind of touched on it, but didn't uh, really say specifically. Uh, you do know that on the lower end of the temperature spectrum, Brett produces fruitier notes uh, at the very beginning, and then over the over the course of time, it'll remetabolize some of those compounds, and it'll give you some uh, some some horse blanket or some barnyard kind of flavors. Not all Bretts will do this. Some of them will just be pretty fruity and then turn from fruity into like dry and almost grass-like. Uh, but uh, a hack if you want to get more of those funky flavors earlier on is just ferment warm. So Brett can uh, be fermented up to you know 80 plus degrees to get some of those funky flavors to appear a little bit sooner. Either way, like Logan said, definitely can be uh, drank did early on. All right. Well, let's just go right into the malt now for uh, this style. And uh, we choose, chose brew malts. Um, <laughs> and what I kind of offered as an alternative to brew malt is melanoidin malt, which uh, more of you out there might be familiar with. Um, but brew malt is going to be um, a sort of slightly melanoidin base. It's going to have um, some complex sugars in it. Um, and it's also going to have a touch of acidity. Um, and the reason why I chose this malt um, in the beer is because um, because of that drying impact that Brett's going to have, um, a little bit of those complex sugars um, are going to add some complexity, add a little bit of sweetness back to the beer so it's not absolutely bone dry. Um, and, uh, and then that acidity is actually going to complement some of the fruitiness that you're going to pull off of Brett, at least in its early stages. Um, and that's also one of the things that the style guidelines do point out is that um, that can be acidic, um, and that's not necessarily from the bread itself. Usually that's going to be from your grain bill. So brew malts to get a bit uh, an easy rundown. It's kind of like honey malt a little bit. Um, it's actually uh, where honey malts came from. It's the, the same idea that honey malts was derived from. Um, but basically it's a good balance of that honey-ish like sweetness and some nice tartness from the acidity that it is treated with. Yeah. To, to give it to you straight, Doctor, um, I would also uh, restrain on a say five gallon batch of beer. Um, I would only shoot for um, somewhere in the realm of of about a third to maybe a half pound, um, just because these malts can be pungent. Um, if you start using a pound or more, um, it's probably going to overwhelm any of the other flavors in the beer, um, unless you're doing a darker version. So. Um, but, but again, these are, this is, these are bread beers, so if you too, use too much, it's probably just going to age into a nice dry beer anyway. Yeah, that's true, yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it is something. I guess it will eventually chew through, but it, but we're talking a difference of um, drinking a beer after a month versus drinking a beer after a year. So just depends on what you're going there. At the same time, if you're going to age it for a year, um, that's probably less of an impact after that. So Throw a lot of sweetness at it. Yep, you can throw plenty of sweetness at these beers, um, and that actually will help, too, because you don't want the body to be overly thin. Um, and so, anyway, that is going to be the malt. Otherwise, uh, the rest of the grain bill, um, you're going to use um, probably under-modified malts, if you can find them. Um, things like... Um, flaked you know, wheat. Flaked say, oats. Yep, some, some flake stuff. Um, even some, some raw stuff. Even some just good old white wheat as, as some base malt, maybe, um, maybe 50 white wheat and 50 of just a pale malt. Um, and then a little bit of that uh, brew malt in there, and that'll also help balance out your acidity, um, which, which is a really the, the main reason why I chose that malt is because it gives you a little bit of that acidity, a little bit of that tartness. Um, it's going to take those fruity notes and turn them into, like, pineapple-type character. Nice. Um, which, you know, in a, in a, in a Brett, especially a Brett Lambicus beer, that's, that's what I'm looking for is that little, like, pop of pineapple. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, let's get on to uh, the hops. Um, this one I kind of pulled out of my butt, but I feel like it would work really well. Yeah, so we uh, the hop of the week is Galena. Uh, with a lot of these bread beers, it's kind of, uh, you know, choose your oyster, how you want to work with it. Do you want it to be a hoppier bread beer or not too hoppy? Uh, some bread strains will be slightly inhibited by overly hopped beers. So we usually say recommend if you're going to do the hopping, do a little bit in the boil and then a little bit in the dry hop for the hop flavor. But that said, there are a lot of strains that are absolutely not bothered by uh, hops at all. So you, if you want to make a Brett IPA, you totally can. Uh, in fact, Stone did one a while ago, Enjoy After, and I tried it really, really fresh when it was not aftered, and it was really good. And yeah. then I also tried it as a, an Enjoy After, and it was also really good. <laughs> Two different beers, though. Completely changed. Yep. Uh, but yeah, so we chose Galena. But Galena was born in Idaho. Go Idaho. I know, right? I didn't even know that until I looked it up. I was like, There's oh, that's cool. There's quite a few flops, uh, hops, actually, that were uh, uh -huh. you know, Idaho-derived. Idaho and I'm like, pretty sure they're just like right across the border from us in Idaho too. It's like uh, the, the it's like Wallace Wallacey area. It's yeah, it's not too far, but it's like uh, you know, if you go over to like Wallace and then take a south. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, Galena is known uh, as a super alpha variety, uh, known for its cleanness um, as a bittering hop. Um, generally, yeah, you're looking at alphas like usually it runs about 12ish percent. 
um, from my experience with it. With that said, like every hop, it's going to vary year to year. I've seen it as low as seven. I've seen it as high as thirteen. Yeah, yeah. It can be. Uh, it can have quite a range. Uh, but it was one of the hops that was originally bred to be uh, basically so that you can use less hops. Yep. Um, in big big beers or big beers made by the big companies and uh but it actually has a nice uh, round flavor I can, I, you can yeah. use it as a balancing hop in ipas and you can use it in uh in low amounts for like a wheat beer or even a lager style beer um so it's versatile i think the number one recommendation i've seen for it though is things like barley wines and stouts yeah but uh yeah the main thing is that it is sort of this like combination between kind of american new world hops you know like your cascades um amarillo simcoe whatever you name it um, blended with a little bit more traditional of the UK varieties that are going to give you those floral notes. And that's why I feel like it works really well. Um, one of the big qualities that you can get, especially from um, late hop additions, and I can verify this because I've used it quite a bit some years back, um, is sort of this black currant character from it. Um, and uh, so uh, using less in the boil, um, doing maybe a couple ounces at, at a sort of whirlpool or flame out addition, um, will give you some of that black currant flavor, and then you might get a little pop of that citrusiness um, by adding a dry hop later on in the process. Um, otherwise, that's it for Galena. Yeah. Uh, on to our yeast. Wait for it. It's Britannomyces. No way. Yeah. No way. There actually are a lot of strains of Britannomyces, and they are broken down into uh, three um. main categories uh, in the homebrew world. They're called Britannomyces bruxellensis, Britannomyces, Britannomyces lambicus, and Britannomyces clausenii. Um, yeah. From, from the ones that are very, very achievable. Um, but they actually are categorized uh, with a lot of substrains there, too. So yeah, there apparently are lamb is actually a substrain of, of uh, Brux, too. I don't believe that. I didn't even know that. I don't believe it. <laughs> you're wrong there. I'm pretty sure you're wrong there. And uh, so but anyway, um, uh, speaking of Brett Lamb, I think that's the one that we would go for with uh, this breakdown of, of what we're shooting for. Because we're going to really shoot for essentially a dry hopped. 100% Brett beer is, is what I had in my mindset for our beer of the week. Um, if you're going to do a darker version, um, I think uh, the regular Brett Brex might be a better option and letting that age for um, the better part of probably five or six months um, is going to give you a really nice balance of flavor profile. Um, that's also something that you might want to do a mixed fermentation with um, where you actually co-pitch uh, Britannomyces at the same time. Um, with some kind of a Saccharomyces strain, some kind of a British strain, um, I think will go really well with it. So, um, yeah, so that is our beer of the week. Um, let us know if you have fermented with some uh, Brett, um, or if you have questions, make sure to throw them up at the end of the show. Um, so let's go right on to our discussion topics, and we're just going to go right on down the line with the whole Britannomyces and um, mixed fermentations, um, some sort of miss about Brett uh, and you know what a lot of people do because a lot of people are actually afraid of using um, Britannomyces in the beer and uh, so so let me just start out by s going through um, a quick list of things that uh, Brett will and will not do um, so first of all um, Brett will not contaminate everything in your brew house if you use proper uh, cleaning methods proper sanitation um, you're going to kill the Brett just with everything else. Um, it is not the super bug that everyone thinks it is. Um, it's just something that um, I guess gets in more commercial brew houses because, uh, because they have lots of little bits and crevices um, unlike your homebrew scale. Um, and like I said, proper cleaning sanitation, that's the key. Um, and also it does not need several years to age out. Like we just mentioned in this beer, um, a two to three week turnover is fine for 100% fermented uh, Brett beer. Uh, and then also it does not always taste like horse blanket. Um, that is generally from long aged beers, specifically with uh, Brett Bruxellensis. Um, and, uh, and that also means that the beer was, was either brewed or treated in a specific way as well. It, it can actually have a very wide range of flavors. Um, and it does not uh, always make your beer sour. Um, so Brett, uh, Brett generally won't produce uh, any lactic acid, um, but uh, it's, uh, uh, the sourness usually comes from um, other, other bac bacteria, other microbes that might be living in the same beer um, that is fermented with the Brettanomyces. Um, but Peter, what will Brett do? 
Uh, well, first of all, I want some clarification on the Brett Brooks versus B Brett Lamb thing. Uh, all uh, the so the Brett Lamb species, all the different uh, speciation names. Their species name is Bruxellensis, Takara Bruxellensis. Um, but Brett Brooks, the one that you can get commercially slash homebrew wise, Brett Lamb is not a subspecies of that Brett Brooks. That's what I was. Yeah, just wanted clarification because I got really confusing and I was like, that's not how it works. But anyways, clarification. Sorry for the uh, the long awkward pauses. Um, yeah, uh, one thing that I wanted to also talk about uh, is that not all strains of Brett um, ferment maltose. And so most of the ones that you can get uh, as a home, uh, from a homebrew store will ferment maltose, but a lot of strains do not ferment. I would say a lot of uh, uh, wild strains do not ferment, ferment maltose. And so it is possible that a certain strain of Brett won't even ferment most of your beer. Two different clarifications. Sorry for the long, awkward pause. Um, Brett will f produce some fruitiness <laughs> I, I didn't know where you were going with that you like, threw me off uh, well you got distracted okay anyway it will one. produce um drier beer over extended periods of time um that's something to be expected um and it will add complexity to uh the flavor profile of your beer um that is that's probably the biggest benefit of of using brett in a beer versus a sack strain is that um, it produces a lot of flavor compounds that the sack strains just will not produce. Um, yeah, so it, it can also eat, it has a different metabolism than Saccharomyces. And so uh, one great example of this is Brett is one of the uh, um, the yeasts that can ferment alcohol. Yeast, uh, Brett can actually eat alcohol, a lot of strains. Um, and it does this under mildly aerobic conditions. Uh, uh, and that's one of the many, uh, many products that Saccharomyces makes that Brett can ferment. And so that's kind of why Brett kind of keeps chugging over a long course of time versus, you know, throw it and like let it uh, explode like a quike strain would in a short amount of time. Um, and it's also why it cleans up a lot of beers if you are trying to, uh, basically if you have some off flavors in your beer and you're trying to see if Brett's going to fix it, it eats a lot of the things that Saccharomyces makes. Yeah. Things like acetyl aldehyde and, yes. uh, diacetyl probably too. It'll clean that up a little bit for you. Yep. Bam. All right. So what are you saying about Brett Lamb strain? Oh, uh -huh. you're, you're going into the strains now? Yeah. I was going into different strains. All right. So, yeah. So that is what Brett will do for you. Um, so let's go ahead and give you a, a breakdown of the three main strains. Um, so first of all, um, the Brett Bruxellensis, as we know it, um, that's the notorious horse blanket strain, um, which is just an awful descriptor for anything. I mean, why did we come up with that? I don't know. I mean, I that's get it. It's got that same. So anything that reminds you, I've also heard sweaty goat. Anything uh. that reminds <laughs> you of the barnyard, like, uh, you know, hey, you're in a farmhouse. It's kind of what they're going for, but uh, yeah, horse blanket. It gives it that funkiness, and I don't know how to describe it other than horse blanket because that's what I've called it since we started, but it tastes and smells delicious. Yeah. So, uh, Brett, uh, wait. Bam. Oh, yeah. So, Brett Brux, known for um, its funkiness, known for, yeah, I, I like the hay note better. That's usually what I'll get from it. Um, that kind of wet hay type character. It's got some grassiness. It's warm wet hay, though. It's got warm wet hay. Well, I feel like if it's cool wet hay, you kind of get that like musky. Is it dewy, dewy hay? <laughs> dewy hay. <laughs> dewy hay. Hey. Um, so that's the classic one. Um, I don't know if you looked. Is that the one that'll really like take stuff down too? Um, uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, so that so one will yeah produces exo uh, yeah so so that one will produce amylase. So it'll just it'll basically take the beers down to zero given an, enough time. Um, and then the next one, which is probably my favorite, is going to be Brett Lambicus. Um, and obviously the name um, means that this is a strain that uh, is used in mixed fermentation lambics. So all your traditional um, lambics that are just super, super sour. Um, sourness is actually from uh, some uh, lacto and acetobacter in there. Uh, but uh, the Lambicus is what's going to give it those like uh, black cherry notes. That's, that's the, the classic um, flavor profile that's developed from that. Uh, so yeah, uh, black cherry, young. This is going to be super super fruity. It's going to give you those pineapple-y type characters when it characteristics when it's young. And uh, yeah, so that is Brett Lamb, and then uh, Brett, Brett Clausiensii. Or dang it, I said I did it again. Clausiensii. Klaus I, I, I even said I was going to do this right at the beginning. Yep. I'm British now. Apparently, I add extra syllables to things. Um, and uh, so just putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so it is going to deliver um, sort of a balance between uh, the Brux and the lamb and, and my experience with it. Um, and it also is going to give you those pineapple type notes. 
Um, it's going to have a little bit of funk associated with it. Um, this one almost, from my experience, seems to get cleaner with age to an extent. If that sounds weird, it's going to be like oddly funky at first, and then it develops um, over time into like a more pleasant funk. So that's that's about all I can say about uh, Brett C. Um, and that's kind of how I usually be classifying is is Brett B, Brett L, and Brett C. Brett C is um, one of those ones that uh, I, I think is also really good um, as a as a younger hop too, because it does produce some fruity tone or younger beer like for hoppy styles of Brett beers. Yeah, because uh, it has a lot of fruity tones that blend in with uh, with the hops. Uh, and then obviously with age, it just kind of dries out and becomes a nice yep. poppy yeah. Belgian yeah, Brett, kind of beer. Either the, the Brett C or um, Brett B um, are going to be the, probably the best ones to actually finish off beer with. Um, I know that is a practice for especially higher gravity beers um, or just beers that um, you want to be a little bit more shelf stable. Um, you can actually finish them with Brett, assuming that you're not going to have them stored in a super warm spot. So just because that whole cleaning cleaning up ability of them. Yeah. Uh, also, another fun fact is the Britannomyces that uh, a lot of homebrewers use are not the same Britannomyces strains that a lot of winemakers are super afraid of infecting their uh, their warehouses. One of the key components to whether or not uh, a, uh, a Britannomyces strain will get super infectious is its ability to ferment cellulobios. Cellulobios. Uh, basically wood. Some Brett strains can ferment wood. Yeah. Yeah, that I actually I knew that. That's... Uh that's interesting because they say, well, I guess bread is a fungus, so never mind. Yeah. Uh, fungus are the only things that can break down uh, cellulose. It's, it's so. a fungus. Uh, there's <laughs> fungus among us. There is fungus among us. I don't. Yeah. We should have looked up. We never looked it up. Where Where did bread come from? Did we ever look that up? Jesus. <laughs> it came from Jesus. Jesus Christ made bread. Uh, <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Uh, anyway, so yeah, those are the Brett strains. Um, so let's go into using them in mixed fermentations now and just um, sort of go over our experience um, with with mixing Brett with other microbes. Um, sort of the best way to do it, you know, especially if we're talking about a sort of barrel age program, a Solera program like what we have started here. Um, something like you probably clicked on the thumbnail for. So, uh, yeah, go ahead and take it away, Pedro. Uh, yeah, so first of all, uh, like we've s said this entire time, there is a way to do Brett as 100% uh, ferment, but more often than not, you're going to be doing it as, as a co-pitch. Uh, that said, a lot of times uh, people will say you got to ferment out your beer almost all the way and then add your uh, Britannomyces. That's true to an extent, but at the same time, Brett is not very competitive with sac most Saccharomyces strains. So if you do do a, an initial co-pitch, um, I'm thinking things like uh, the Rosalaire Brent blend from Y East or the Sour Batch Kid from uh, uh, Imperial, something yeah. like that, um, then the Saccharomyces strain definitely still will be the first thing to take a hold. And then after the Saccharomyces is done, having the simple, easy sugars that everything can eat, um, Brett will kind of go back and just chew through everything and build a nice uh, profile over time. Yeah, so those are going to take some time. Um, you're also going to get um, much less of an impact from the Brett when you're co-pitching too. Um, so if you want just a little bit of funk but don't want to overdo it, uh, those blended yeast strains are actually fantastic ways to get started. And the beauty of that is if you do plan on um, aging those out, I know, you know, you mentioned the Rosalair blend. Um, I did a, uh, oh, what beer was that? Uh, Berliner Weiss, actually, like a true Berliner Weiss uh, with that with that Rosalair strain. And, uh, and so let that just sit in the primary for like 10 months and then actually racked um, beer on top of that when it was finished um, and ended up with a really nice complex sour as a result. And that's because a lot of those, the Saccharomyces yeast had actually died by then. And so you had a lot more Brett surviving. Um, so and yeah. Eating the things that Saccharomyces can. Yeah. Cause that is one thing to note too. If, if you're not familiar, Brett is a survivor. Brett will um, stay in beer for years and years on end and uh, is very good about going into a dormancy stage and not dying like some of the other sack strains will. Somebody's saying, what? No beer? Um, so uh, that is the start of a mixed fermentation. Um, so otherwise, if you want more complexity out of your Britannomyces, it's always great to um, co-pitch it um, with um, uh, lactobacillus is a great start because um, lactobacillus is also kind of a wimp when it comes to the fermentation side of things. Um, bam. Somebody asking about Sour Patch Kids. Um, so lactobacillus... Um, and then uh, a little bit of uh, acetobacter isn't a bad idea as well. 
Acetobacter will get in there no matter what. Yeah, it'll, it'll so Acetobacter likes to have oxygen and that's and that's actually the whole point of using uh, barrels actually as a sort of aging vessel um, or even a primary vessel is that um, the wood is naturally porous. The wood is going to allow in some oxygen um, and that's what's really going to help with that uh, acetic acid development um, and even some malic acid uh, development as well. Um, having uh, the ability to have Brett in there, though, is a really good thing if Acetobacter is in there because, um, first of all, uh, Brett will be able to eat some of the acetic acid, and so you'll get a small uh, vinegary kind of production. That's what acetic acid is. For those of you who don't know, acetic acid is vinegar, um, but uh, it won't get overpowering because you've got uh, Brett in there chewing that back up and, and turning it into ethanol and then yeah. eating the ethanol depending on the Brett. People are wanting SCOBY beers now. Uh, yeah, so one thing that you will notice, too, is that you know, a lot of Brett beers um, – ooh, actually, is it Brett? Do all strains form a pellicle? I'm pretty sure some strains form a pellicle. Uh, they form different pellicles. I'm, pre I'm, sure all, I'm pretty sure all strains form a pellicle, but I'm not 100% uh, on yeah, that. Yeah, so you'll typically see a pellicle if you are aging – excuse me. In the presence of oxygen, because um. what a pellicle is, is it's the, the, the Brett's natural way of trying to make it anaerobic in there. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's a way to protect itself. Um, with that said, lactobacillus will also produce a pellicle, so um, it's not always going to be from Brett. Um, and some sac strains actually will form a pell pellicle, too. Yeah. Not most of them. Um, some. Also, during mixed fermentations, uh, you are going to expect uh, the beer to go through sort of different phases of a fermentation, um, and that's pretty typical um, especially when those fermentations have bread in them. Um, you might go through an early phase where you go, wow, this tastes super fruity, tastes really good. And then you might go through a middle phase where you're saying, yeah, this tastes like um, a wet dog um, or an old piece of leather. And then it might actually develop more into those like those complex, uh, you know, cherry notes, for instance. Um, and that's going to happen Some over horse blanket notes. Yeah, that's going to happen over the, the course of, um, you know, you know, a month to six month periods. Um, it's, it's really hard to say because that's going to vary with temperature um, and your specific blend of, of microbes within that beer. Yeah. So with that said, it's one of those things. It poops out, Brett. What? I always get. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. It's uh, when someone's asking basically when uh, what does Brett poop out when it eats ethanol? And uh, it, it actually I'm pretty sure it, uh, it turns it into uh, uh, what's the precursor to ethanol usually. Um, green apple, acetylaldehyde. That thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Turns it into acetylaldehyde. And then uh, it also eats acetylaldehyde and turns it back into ethanol. It will eat everything. It is very good about breaking everything down to get sh get uh, food for itself. Yeah, how how it eats and basically why it metabolizes all these th these things is very dependent on the precursors, and that's why it kind of goes cyclically cyclically in how it tastes and why it'll taste really good like early on, and then it'll start tasting really bad and then taste really good is because um, basically it will eat something and then give you a byproduct, and then once the uh, the other precursors or the other uh, um, catalysts for its metabolism uh, develop in the beer, then it can go back and eat the other thing and turn it into the first thing or turn it into something new. Uh, that's why it kind of goes in these waves is because uh, everything else in the beer is going in waves and uh, you, you have different, uh, different precursors and different uh, metabolites to give the Brett something to chew on. Yep. So anyway, to, to wrap up the whole concept of Brett and using it in mixed fermentations, um, the, the big takeaway from this is don't be afraid to use it and then uh, don't be afraid to let it sit for a while if the flavor profile isn't where you want. Give it a couple months, sample it then, see where it's at. Um, and that's really the biggest advice. If you do plan on bottling, um, just because there are some... Uh, bottle super early on and make sure it's a low pressure rated bottle. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so no, don't do that. Uh, make sure that the, um, you, you do give uh, the bottle a little bit of time and it will develop more carbonation over time depending on which Brett strain you might be using. So yeah. um, kind of, I guess, shoot for under carbonating it. And then if it's not carbonated to where you want it, you're just going to have to give it another month or two and it'll be there. Yeah. So, anyway, that is um, all about uh, Brett, I guess, which kind of turned into the topic of the week. So Topic of the week. Um, so let's go ahead and open things to our general questioning now. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Hey, everybody uh, give this a like right now, by the way, if you are just now tuning in um, or if you've been tuned in, I guess, too. Like um, it right now. <laughs> and then I'm going to go ahead and start answering the first question that I see kind of right at the bottom and probably missed some others. But um, somebody's asking about how to undo 
a Simcoe hop flavor. Um, and I don't think there's really undoing hop flavors, but there is ways to try to overpower them. <laughs> um, and that would be to use a very dry piney hop, I think. Sure. Um, I, uh, I was going to say just just wait. I mean, or or yeah. just wait. I mean, it depends on what flavor you're trying to. So that's kind of like a that, that's a that's a complicated question because I don't know which flavor from Simcoe you're looking for or yeah. you're looking to get rid of. If it's like the super grassiness that comes from how you hopped it, that might come from any hop, then then that doesn't really go away super easily. Um, although certain strains of Brett actually will start to metabolize that. Um, there, but yeah, if it's like the go. super fruitiness. A lot of that will volatilize over time. So yeah. if you make it turn it into an aged beer, then you I'm might thinking end up it's a fruitiness, yeah. And yeah. I would say age I it mean, out. <laughs> either that or just like hit it with uh, what's just like a super like aggressive, like Chinook, just like dry hop the be jeebs out of it with Chinook. With Chinooky. Yeah, just like like four or five ounces in a five gallon batch and just go for it and just turn it into like a beast of an IPA. Um, so yeah, there you go. That is uh, how you might approach. Um, masking or getting rid of the uh, Simcoe flavor. Someone's asking if he doesn't have room for a, a lot of kegs in his kegerator, I'm guessing what he's trying to say there. Um, can you leave the keg out? If it's a Brett beer, for sure. Uh, it yeah, it just that's really going to depend on the beer. You know, I've done it plenty of times. Um, if they're IPAs, I try to avoid it. Yeah, you want to keep those cold, um, for sure. Even if, lagers, like fresh, crispy beers, you want to keep those Yeah, if it's, um, if it's cold. Yeah, any, any other ale style, though, that's not hot forward, um, those are usually pretty forgiving to letting them sit at room temperature. As long as, you know, your keg's sanitary and purged, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, so letting them sit at a room temperature or at the least a coldish room temperature. So if you can get it down to like 60 degrees or below, um, that's, that's going to be all right for beer for, you know, if, if you're only letting it sit for a couple weeks or so, um, that should be fine, you know, just to, just to rotate some things on tap. Um, you know, obviously that's probably not the best for doing months on end unless it is, a beer that you're specifically trying to age. Um, so I'm trying to think of another other than, yeah, I mean, get, get a, get a spare chest freezer, I guess, and put a, put a little temperature controller on it. <laughs> those are, those are cheap. So, um, yeah. Convince your significant other to let you buy more beer stuff. Someone says control Z. <laughs> control Z. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, does, it, does the pellicle ever go away? No, it doesn't. It just gets more pellicle-y. Uh, would Brett overpower your beer if you pitched a 50-50 with a, with a keg strain? It probably wouldn't get the chance to ferment it, depending on how quickly. I mean, if you're bottling it and you're aging it, then eventually it'll start to give some some character. But that quike's going to burn through your beer so fast that that Brett will not stand a chance. Yeah, that's really what I'm thinking. And the quike itself will produce some pretty, like, strong flavors if you ferment it hot so that's i i feel like it would actually be the other way around for uh diamond roads uh so yeah you're actually i feel like you're not gonna hardly get any character from the brett if you're pitching it with with uh quake that's yeah especially because quake can ferment things a lot like pretty dry too so yeah once you've got I, a lot of beefiness to, to let the brett get some work done at the the very back end and then you age it out uh you probably wouldn't have a very balanced brett characteristic mm -hmm. my go-to would actually be ferment on the lower temperature side with some british strains um that's kind of that's kind of where i would lean there for a 50 50 pitch um, talk about different flavors that come out with different serving temperatures. That's a, a, actually a pretty scientific uh, topic. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, for example, gas solubility increases with a decreased uh, temperature. Yeah. And so things like carbonic acid bite um, come out quite a bit at lower serving temperatures. Uh, and that's why you generally perceive colder beers as this brighter, fresher kind Crisper. of taste. Yeah. Crisp. Same kind of thing with soda. Like why soda tastes so fresh is because it's, it's highly, highly carbonated. Um, so, uh, but then when you start to warm beers up, you get a lower carbonation and a lot of the malt flavors as well as some fruity flavors that are subtle in the beer come out. So at like 38 to 42, you'll start to get like a pretty good balance between the crispness of uh, the CO2 and the malt flavors or whatever fruity flavors are in the beer. Uh, and then traditional like cask style beers, any pretty much most English beers, those are designed to really lean into malt flavors. Yeah. So even if they're not like malt forward beers, they'll start to perceive as malt forward, uh, forward flavors in that 50 to 55 degree range when you get into that like cask style. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've noticed that and I'm sure, you know, that's something that we'll probably have to look up one day um, and maybe even do a whole video about it. Who knows? Um, but yeah, the, the science behind it, because one thing that I have noticed on several occasions with something like IPAs, which are highly aromatic, mm -hmm. um, is that as they warm up, 
you tend to get more um, sweet notes from them. So, um, you know, the beer might go from being um, dank and piney to like sweet and like melony or guava type characters as the beer warms up through the spectrum. Um, so, and I don't really know the science behind that. I just know that I've experienced it on, you know, several different occasions right now, but I'm sure there is some reasoning behind that. Someone found us through our partial mash video. Which one? <laughs> Cause we have a really old one, which is probably not so great. And then we have a relatively new one, which was I probably think, better. I think it was, I think it was pretty funny. I got uh, to drink a lot of beer. Do we filter our lagers while kegging? Oh, that great question. Um, generally, no, actually. Um, filtration is just as much of a pain in the butt on a commercial scale as it is on a homebrew scale. <laughs> um, and that's the reality. Um, while it can be done, it is, it's a lot easier to um, fine your beer. And that is a practice that we do with almost every beer that we brew. Yeah. Um, and we have played around with a whole lot of fining agents. I think our go-to now, we sort of shifted from gelatin, um, which has kind of been hit and miss in the past. Sometimes it works really well. Other times it just won't do anything um, to a two-part fining agent um, using the, I mean, they come in a- Kytosol and yeah. Kieselsol and Kytosan. Super, super clear is the uh, yeah. is kind of the brand that, that we carry that has both of them built into it too. Yeah. So if you're kind of looking online, in fact, maybe we'll, uh, if we can find an Amazon link, we'll throw that down in the description there. Um, yeah, some people, if you want to go per, like purely vegan, will just use uh, the Kiesel saw, which is BioFine, because <laughs> it's vegan friendly. Uh, that doesn't clear <laughs> out everything, though. It's very dependent on the acidity of the beer, actually. Uh, sorry, some, somebody's asking about ascorbic acid. <laughs> <laughs> ascorbic acid! <laughs> I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Uh, I started keg conditioning about. a beer to guard several weeks ago and didn't add any sugar. Uh, do I need to worry about pressure in the keg? I would, I would put your keg under about 5 PSI just to make sure it's sealed and then uh, figure out the pressure on the back end. Um, you can check it every once in a while to see if it's building pressure. Um, but yeah, other than that, I wouldn't, it probably is going to be not going to be something to worry about. All right. Uh, and then also that depends on head space. Um, so if it's super, super, super full, maybe, but still probably not. Yeah. Um, somebody's asking about, oh gosh, where do we go now? Um, it was a good one too. Oh yeah. Warm mash temps with Brett. Um, and yes, actually, that's that's uh, thank you for asking that because that is something that we definitely overlooked. Um, and definitely shooting on the high end of your mash temp will really give your uh, Brett an upper hand um, to give some of those long chain sugars for it to chew on. So uh, definitely would recommend that. I know. Um, I would I would say fifty fifty on that. I personally yeah. I like to build any extra body and dextrins just by throwing them in my malt bill. So I like to take care of it in the malt bill rather than worrying about the mash yeah. temp. Um, just because I like to reduce variables, and so if I'm mashing at almost the same temperature every single time, I, I that's how I like to add any sort of body to give Brett something to chew on. Um, I don't I'd go think high. I yeah. go high. I know you would. <laughs> I wouldn't be afraid to. Um, and I guess it depends on actually how long you're aging it too. So I get what you're saying. If it's a if it's a beer that you're trying to turn over in a few weeks, um, if it is a beer that you plan on letting sit for a while, um, honestly, like a 160 mash, sure, go for it. You know, it'll it'll take it a while to chew through everything, but um, I don't see it hurting nothing at that point. So the partial mash video that he watches is the one that I'm making you do all the work, and I'm drinking a lot of beer. Nice. He said too much, but I don't understand what that means. <laughs> Uh, that is, that is not a, uh, not a word in Peter's vocabulary. Um, also mash, uh, mash efficiency might go down with a higher mash temp. So you might not get a hundred percent of the shuggies you want. Uh, Have you ever heard of ascorbic acid? Do we put How about biofine? I'm see, I'm lost into where these comments came up versus when we, what we were talking about. Oh, that was when we were talking about using the two part, uh, coconut question what was the coconut question again something about how you add coconut if it was how you add coconut i like to buy toasted uh, oh, flaked coconut that. and then i use that in secondary um, i buy that because it's pre-packaged and uh, because it comes in a package i'm not super worried about having to sterilize it in any sort of way and then uh, i can throw that into the bottom of my secondary fermenter and let it sit on that for about five days and then rack it into my keg uh, so, and then biofine, yes, also a, a good agent. Uh, we do not put shellfish warnings on our beer. Mostly because um, we don't package. Yeah, we don't package. Um, yeah, that's from I the Kytosan. I feel like we probably never would because it is such a low amount either. Um, I feel like there's, there's probably thresholds that you have to pa uh, pass in order to, that require you to do that. And it's, I mean, we're talking like stupidly low amounts. And it all drops out. That's the whole point of it. So, um, And then, so what's our next one here? 
Uh, he has a bottle of Brett. My eyes are not very good, so I'm trying to. <laughs> uh, Peter's blind. There is uh, no such thing as too much. With, uh, okay, friend, I received a bottle of apricot sour with some Brett C. Uh, planning to add the Brett into the fermenter. How long would you let it go? Um, what, if you're adding Brett C for uh, basically uh, trying to get some, some wild character on that, and it's already been fermenting for three months. I would probably say you'd need to let the Brett C go for quite a while. Yeah, um, another six months at least. Yeah, and then the only way that I that I could see you getting around that is if you heated that thing up to like eighty and tried to get it done in a couple months, like two three months. But I mean, uh, it's summertime, throating up in your attic. Yeah, the longer the better. <laughs> Yolo. Uh, what I, what I would <laughs> no, say is like let it go best. for let it go for a couple more months and then go ahead and bottle everything and then let it f- uh, finish kind of doing its thing in the bottle. And that way you can at least take a bottle, you know one month down the road and then another month down the road and you can start seeing where it's tasting really good. Uh, somebody's saying they're hitting 90% on a rim system. And is that possible or are they doing calculations wrong? Uh, depends on your beers. Yeah, that's, that is possible. Um, for, especially for low alcohol beers. If you're doing yeah. low alcohol beers, um, I know that I have pushed the mid eighties before, like even doing a brew in a bag, I think I hit over 80% brew house efficiency. Um, with that said on high alcohol beers, um, it is possible that you're missing out on a few calculations. Um, 90% is pretty ridiculous. Um, that, that, that I feel like is only achievable if you're doing like, um, a two hour boil and you have zero dead space in your mash ton kind of et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah uh, you also got to talk a little bit about, uh, whether it's you know, mash efficiency or total brew house efficiency. So final product efficiency or mash efficiency, if it's mash efficiency, then probably. Oh yeah. Yeah. You should be able to get 90% mash efficiency almost every time. But yeah, right. I mean, there's so many, so many places for you to lose beer in the entire brew. Yeah. House that's the process, reality. So. Like a West coast IPA, you're going to have 10% hop absorption. So. I mean, that's <laughs> that that's kind of the, the reality. So it's like if you're unless you're not adding your hops to your beer, um, it's going to be really hard to actually hit something as high as 90 percent. With that said, it is possible. So um, your numbers may be actually telling you the right thing. Um, um, how much coconut per five gallons? I usually just go about a pound, maybe a pound and a half, but a pound and a half can start to get pretty sweet. I'm about to sneeze. But I do, you do I do use the uh, um, the store bought toasted flake coconut. Stuff that's like already ready to go in pie and pies and stuff. Okay, I guess I'm not gonna sneeze. <laughs> um, are we doing a black is beautiful variant? I just heard about that yesterday. Am I living under a rock? Um, you might be. Maybe I don't know. Do we? We we haven't like collabed with anybody on it, but we we brew dark beers a lot, so I'm not against it. Sure, <laughs> whatever makes people happy. That's all I try to do. Um, and we haven't planned to yet, I guess is the short answer. Yeah. But we are all about it. If somebody um, wants to do it. How much for so Have we brewed a Lambic with Brett? Consider doing a video on Lambic brew. Uh, so yeah, we have done a lot of Lambic style beers. We end up doing Flanders styles more than Lambics. Um, that said, uh, we wouldn't be opposed to it, but that'd be like a three year video. Unless we do. I don't know if we have, uh, we actually, we have one barrel that might be Lambicable currently but nah, uh, it's gonna take another year for sure yeah but then we, we, we wouldn't have the start to finish so if we did a start to finish video yeah we would start it yeah. now and get back to you in two years yeah <laughs> three years because we want to do a, per, a proper goose a, a, oh a, a gez a blend of a one year and a three year uh, nice all right uh, spontaneous fermentation do you need to worry about botulism ph of wort and cool ship uh if you're um so if depending on the short answer is no. Yeah. Um, so first of all, if you hop it at all, that's going to be a lo- that's going to help you a lot. Uh, second of all, usually botulism or botulinum toxin uh, toxin develop over a longer period of time. So if you should you should be trying to get that spontaneous fermentation happening in a relatively short amount of time, two days, something like that. Um, and uh, uh, again, with the cool ship, that's maximizing your surface area. So uh, the acidity. Uh, I don't know the exact acidity, but uh, if you wanted to pre-acidify, you can definitely just get that thing down to 4.2 is proper food safe. Um, 4.5 should still be fine. And then then you don't have to worry about it at all. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, Brett. Uh, hey, that's cool. Brett's tuning in when we're talking about Brett. Hey, Brett. Um, and uh, we are we will put a link to some uh, two-part finding agents uh, down below. So you'll just have to check back on this video once it gets up, up and published. Um, so otherwise, uh, let, we'll probably answer just a couple more questions here before we finish out this brew day 
Or brew day. Jesus. Yeah, we're brewing currently. This live stream. <laughs> we're actually not brewing. <laughs> uh, some think we're crazy. Uh, what is the difference between chip malts um, and something like carapils? I've recently been playing with it and think I can taste the difference, but not sure. Ooh. Yes, uh, chip yeah, malt tastes totally. way better. Chip malt actually has flavor. Um, no, that's one thing we... I know Peter and I, we always laugh because we see carapils in every recipe. And uh, carapils, if you actually look up the stats on it, um, it is specifically designed to not have flavor. Um, and that's why we laugh because it is, it is only designed to, um, to basically boost body, boost uh, more so the alcohol in a beer, and boost the head retention without adding any flavor component whatsoever, being completely neutral. Whereas chip malt actually has a really nice grainy character. Um, and one thing that I'm sure we've mentioned before um, is that chip malt is actually a really easy way if you have, um, say, a domestic pale malt um, that uh, you can sort of pseudo a pilsner out of it um, by adding in a couple pounds of chip malt to your grain bill just to get a little extra graininess um, and kind of emulate that pilsner style malt. So. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, did you already talk about the diastatic power as well? Oh no, I haven't. Uh, yeah. So chip malt actually has a ton of diastatic power, that whereas carapils, because yeah. it's a because uh, it's a pseudo caramel how it's made or pseudo crystal style how it's made does not. Yep. So uh, yeah, that is that is the big difference between chip malt and uh, carapils is. Uh, but just yeah, chip's use, a great one. Yeah. Carapils yeah. every time. Chip, chip's a great way to get a lot of body and head retention. We use it in a lot of our beers. Does all the same bread. things, just has um, good flavor to yeah, it. Yeah. Sometimes That's when I don't want like the. Uh, the extra graininess of like a flaked wheat or a flaked whatever i'll, I'll use yeah. chit as my as my bodybuilder it's got a lot of great precursors and everything in chit that needs to be uh um that get that it needs to get into your beer to give you that uh, extra body is also super soluble compared to something like a flaked wheat yeah i'm so. definitely going to be using it in like some higher adjunct stuff in the future too now that we know that the diastatic power is so high um it actually has or is it a six row malt is it is it huh? like no chits? It's, it's, it's still a, a two row, yeah. yeah. But it actually has higher diastatic power than even six row malt does. So yeah, um, pretty uh, crazy high there. Yeah, and a lot of that also comes from the uh, the grain that they select to to go into it. Um, Somebody saying, "Did we see the news from Omega that they isolated the a new strain of Quike from their Hornadol blend and call it Lutra?" Uh, no, we haven't ordered from Omega yet, though. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to order from Omega here, just because they're yeah. across the country and. We might be able to go in with, um, I actually, um, Hello Brew uh, Co. in Spokane ordered some yeast from them. They actually just got one yesterday. That's how I know that. Oh, cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Try it was a good it. thing I was down there. I was like, oh, yeast, okay. Um, so, yeah, maybe we'll go in on order with them and, uh, and get something to play around with in the future. But, yeah, as for now, um, you know, we've been really happy with our more local guys. So. Yeah, that strain sounds super cool, though. It's supposed to be, like, good for lagers and West Coast-style IPAs, but it quikes like a, like a quike does, so... If it if it quakes like a quake and uh, that's all I got. <laughs> How, <laughs> yeah, great uh, joke. Hey, How does a beer become infected with a band aid like off flavor? Asking for a friend. Um, <laughs> well, you should tell your friend that there's a couple different ways that it can happen. It can be an infection with. Uh, oh um, my goodness. Uh, some some wild strains, uh, Pedio, something like that. Yeah, I was gonna say it's Pediococcus. Um, but it mm. also can be uh, chlorophenol, uh, depending on where you got it from. It can also be hose water. Uh, oh I, yeah. I knew one person that was using hose water to fill like garden hose water to do their brew day, and uh, the beer ended up tasting like that's hose water, which is very similar to Band Aid. Yeah, that's probably the most common thing is you're getting what's called a chlorophenol, um, which which I believe is the same Band Aid type flavor. Um, most likely it's actually not an infection. Most likely it's going to be a water source issue. So um, just like we talked about last week, call back. Hey. Um, yeah, so um, uh, uh, chlorophenols are caused by chlorine and or chloramines in your water. So, Have you guys ever made a lager with quike looking to do some smoked hellas and uh, don't have access to a fermentation fridge to log lager at room temp? Uh, we have... Have we? No, we haven't. No, we haven't. We have not. Um, we've done a lot of fruity beers with Quike. Yeah, we've done, tried to do fruity beers. I don't. My we'll, we'll try it at it some is, point in time. Is the strains that we've used at least the what? What is it? The is it the Voss strain that we typically use? Yeah, Voss is the one that we more. Uh, it use does the most not like to be very cold. I know that I've dropped it down into even the 60s before, and it and we had to really baby it to finish it up even in the 60s. Yeah. Um. So I don't know if I would really recommend it i know the maybe the hornadol strain will, will be a little better 
Yeah, um, but that's well, not something or this that we new uh, Lutra, or what, maybe what the, the maybe the, from, uh, the Lutra. Omega yeast. Is it Lutra or Lutra? I don't know. Probably. Yeah, but that if that one two. can do uh, lager lageriness at, at uh, warm temperatures. I know there are some strains of Quike that uh, can taste pretty clean at warm temperatures. So that'd be yeah. the way to do it: get it to ferment out and then uh, and then drop yeah. it into a keg for uh, conditioning. And that's one thing with the Voss strain is that even like seventy five degrees, it stays really clean. So um, yeah, you really have to push the temperature range to get that funk and stress out of it. So. Would we consider a live brew day? We've done one before. Uh, brew days are long, and so uh, like a five-hour live stream might be too long. Maybe if you did a speed brew challenge. Speed brew challenge. We yeah, that'd be, one, one of those. be a tricky one. I don't know how we do that. Um, I know we did one for big brew day, but, yeah, it was kind of a cluster because we had other things going on. So it is tricky because we do have to open up during the day, and we are open seven days a week. So it's with customers in here, we probably have to do it off-site, which means you wouldn't have good internet for uploads. So. Yeah. Um, min and max PSI you have fermented at. Um, I mean, we've done zero PSI fermentations, um, and we've also that's probably pretty close to the minimum. I don't know if we've gone below that. Yeah, <laughs> vacuum fermentation. <laughs> vacuum. Oh, there you, now you're <laughs> talking. That might be weird. Um, but uh, yeah, as for the maximum, um, you know, I have researched fermenting, you know, up and above even 30 PSI. Um, and you will start to put some additional stress on your yeast at that point. But if you have a good, healthy pitch, um, they should be able to chug through it. Um, otherwise, I know we have fermented usually between 10 and 15 PSI. And that's that's surely um, uh, has to do with that's that's what our tank um, pressures are, our working pressures are for um, on any of our uni tanks. So when we're spunding, generally, it'll only be about 15 PSI. Yeah, that's what I've got the uh, sour that we got going on over there at. Uh, so. Set it to about 15 PSI. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we haven't ever done a side-by-side -side with it, too, but I know we definitely have done some beers where I feel like the hop aromatics seem to be exceptionally um, pungent in, and uh, present compared to um, non-spunded beers or non-pressure fermented beers. All right. Uh, My speed brews are still like two and a half hours from start <laughs> to finish for all grain. I guarantee you both Logan and I can do an all grain batch in under an hour. Uh, I think this time when we do a speed brew challenge, I'm going to win because I'm going to go second and steal all his ideas like he did for me when we did the extract version. No, I just didn't do all your dumb things that you did wrong. No, <laughs> you stole you stole my uh, you stole a couple of my ideas, too. <laughs> and then all you right. added your own. Uh, but I know exactly what I'm going to do for my speed brew already, so it doesn't uh, really matter. There's only <laughs> copying me. All right. One more question, then we're going to finish this guy up. Thank you all for watching today. Um, please remember to like this video and subscribe if you are not already. Um, like somebody's asking. Oh, yeah. If you haven't liked the video, you right there. Put put a thumbs up on it, <laughs> please. So it helps. Oh, also, we, we got over 300 likes on that uh, the uh, uh, two-barrel tank review, by the way. And oh, I, nice. I said at the end of that video that if uh, we got over 300 likes, we'd have to buy a second one. Yeah, you're going to have to bring that up with your mom. Um. Uh, so somebody's saying that they've had some bad experience with, with imperial yeast. Uh, and I think that was the pressure fermentation. That's a Both were slow and under-fermented. Oh, experience. Yeah, oh. no, that's a different one. Um, and my only recommendation is, um, you know, always check um, your packaged on dates for your yeast. Make sure that you're getting as fresh a yeast as possible. We've had more or less nothing but positive experiences, but we also um, try to do starters with yeast as well. Um, so it's going to be dependent on every strain. Biggest thing is just check your source where you're getting your yeast from. Make sure it's fresh. Um, they they claim to have a uh, four months shelf life on them, um, but that's four months if it's pr if it's kept properly. If uh, yeah, and that's if it's kept properly, you know, right at 35 degrees the the whole time. Yeah. Um, and even our practice here. Um, we try not to let it go much past three months, and we'll actually pull pull it, build it up with a starter, and use it ourselves. Here, yeah, so. if they got to ship it down to like super hot Texas or something like that, and it spends like you know a, a day or an overnight in a really warm environment, and it starts to activate by the time it gets to the homebrew yeah, supply that's store, that's going to significantly yeah make it not happy. Or if you're getting it shipped directly from uh, like let's say a northern brewer style place where they got to ship it to they got to ship you liquid yeast. I never buy liquid yeast online, by the way. So. I, unless uh, unless it's, yeah, just don't buy liquid yeast online. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, we will wrap it up and try to get open now. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so you, some people are Imperial Yeast fanboys. Me we too. will see you next week at 8.45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, just like every other week. 
Give us some ideas. Um, throw some fun stuff in the comments below. We love you all. Um, we actually appreciate everyone that tunes into these that uh, sort of keeps this going, makes it worth our time to um, produce videos like these for you. So we'll see you next time. Peace.